All right, today we're going to go over how to draw free body diagrams for circular motion and how to write net force equations for them. So let's start off with this example. You have a ball attached to a rubber band. I'm going to make it go in an orbit. I was like, all oh, things you might notice. The tension in the rubber band changes uh, at different spots. At the top, the rubber band gets way short. At the bottom, the rubber band gets way long. So that means the tension is increasing once it gets to the bottom. Let's try to figure out why that is. So when the ball is at the top, let's think about the forces acting on it. Uh, so here's the ball, here's the string. Boom. So is there gravity acting on the ball? Of course there is. Which way is gravity going? Gravity is pulling down. I'm actually going to draw that in blue. So gravity is pulling the ball down in blue. Got it. Uh, then there's also tension pulling down because the ball's at the top. I have to pull down Ft. So if I want to write a net force equation for this ball, here's what it would look like. Um, first of all, is there a force? Is there friction? Negligible. Is there a reaction force? Is it, on a, is it resting on anything? Or is, there, is, it, is it sitting on anything? Is anything pushing on it? No. So it's just these two. So a net force equation would look like this. F net equals MA equals FG plus FT because they're going the same direction. So FT plus FG. Now because it's going in a circle, the net force is actually centripetal force because the definition of net force is the force that's left over after everything cancels out, and it's basically what happens to the object, which way does it go. We know it's going in a circle. So the net force is actually centripetal force. And centripetal force has its own equation. Here's all the equations for all the different forces we're going to talk about. Centripetal force has its own equation. So the MA, we can write it as mv squared over r. So there's a setup for the ball at the top. Now, if I want to find the tension in the rope when the ball is at the top, let's see how to pull myself for Ft. Well, I'll subtract Fg from both sides. So Ft equals uh, Fc minus Fg. All right. Let's compare that to when the ball is at the bottom. When the ball is at the bottom, here's the rope. We, have, we still have gravity going down. But now, tension is pulling up. And tension has to be bigger than gravity, because otherwise the ball would just stay there, or gravity is bigger, it would fall. But we know it comes back up, because it completes a circle. So Ft has to be bigger. So if I do the net force equation, following the same pattern, it still is centripetal force, because it's going in a circle. It's still mv squared over r, because that's the equation for centripetal force. But instead of Ft plus Fg, it would be Ft minus Ft, because they're going opposite directions. So now, if I solve for Ft, I would add Fg to the other side. So Ft is equal to Fc plus Fg. Now, if Fc if, if, is the same in both cases, it's the centripetal force causing the orbit. If this is a number, if I take that number and subtract off gravity, that's going to make it a smaller number for tension. If I take that number and add gravity to it, it makes it a bigger number for tension. So that means that this free body diagram has more tension than this free body diagram, which this free body diagram is the ball at the top, this free body diagram is the ball at the bottom. So we know the tension at the bottom has to be more. Now here's another example. Let's see you're driving around in a car, and this is the back view of the car. Here's the license plate. I part physics, I heart P. So that's what Tyson's way says. So we're driving along in this car, and we are just going straight down the highway, but then we want to make a left turn. So we want to make a left turn, and we want the car to turn left. Well, we need to think about what forces allow the car to turn left. Well, let's draw a free body diagram with it, first of all. So is there gravity acting on the car? Of course there's gravity acting on the car, going down. Is there a reaction force in the car? Yeah, the road is pushing the car up so it doesn't fall. That's good. No, let's think about, is there tension on the car? There's no rope on the car. Is there friction? And the answer is yes. In order for you to make a left turn, let's think about what does the car want to do? If I turn my wheels to the left, if there's no friction on the road, what happens to the car? It just keeps going straight. You fly to the outside of the circle. 
look at a top view, it's just my circle, the car is going this way. If there's no friction, the car is going to just keep going that way. So friction is actually gripping the road for you. The tires on the road are gripping the road and pushing the car to the left. So friction is actually pushing the car and tires to the left. Because the car wants to go outwards to the outside of the circle. But friction allows, friction goes in the opposite direct, direction is motion. The car wants to go out, friction causes it to go left, which is why it turns. So friction is going left. It's resisting that outward momentum that the car is trying to get to. It's resisting that outward momentum. It's opposite of the car's motion. So it's causing a new motion because of it. Now, that's it. There, uh, now if I do a net force equation for this, we'll have Fc equals mv squared over r equals, well these forces cancel out, it's just friction. Friction causes a centripetal force. Centripetal force is caused by the result of all the other forces put together. They, these forces combine to make the centripetal force. Whatever force doesn't cancel out, that is the centripetal force. It causes the circular motion to happen. Now, let's look at it. Sometimes the roads aren't flat. Sometimes they purposely will angle the road. So if I want to make a left turn, they'll actually bank the road up so the car is on an incline. Like this. So here's the angle of the road, and now the car is trying to make a left turn. This actually makes it easier for the car to turn left because gravity is going to help the car to slide down because the car wants, as it's going to the left, as it's, oh, sorry, as it's, going, as it's going straight, the car wants to fly to the outside. It wants to keep going in a straight line, which is towards the outside of the circle if it goes fast enough. So what they do is they bank the roads so that gravity helps pull the car down so it doesn't fly outwards. So we look at the forces here, we have gravity pulling down, we have reaction force going up an angle now, instead of straight up, and now these two forces, and even if there's no friction, you don't actually even need any friction anymore because that's not a positive thing about this main road is it reduces the amount of friction you need to make the corner. Even with these two forces, if I combine them, I can still get a leftward force. What I have to do is I have to rearrange these into a triangle. So reaction force goes this way, gravity goes this way, and then which way is the result? Well, I start here and I end up there, I go left. My SC ends up becoming that leg of triangle. It's pushing me to the left. I complete a left turn around this circle. Basically, I'm turning left. Perfect. So now we can use the Pythagorean theorem or Sokotoa to figure out what our forces are. Now, let's try one with a loop-de-loop. -loop. If I take this golf ball and I put it on this hill, boom, it didn't have enough momentum. Boom, it didn't have enough momentum to make it around the loop. If I start on this end, once again, not enough momentum to make it around the loop. If I start with the ball high enough, then its potential energy changes into kinetic energy, giving it enough speed and momentum to make it around the loop. Let's see what that looks like. Yeah, perfect. So now when you think about it, what's the hardest part of the loop to get around? The very top, right? Because the higher up you go, the lower your velocity ends up being because you start losing some velocity and potential energy, and you, because you lose the velocity, you lose momentum. So you tend to flow more. So the hardest part to get around the loop is the very top of the loop. So let's look at our free body diagram with the balls at the top. How fast does this ball need to travel in order to get around the top of the loop? Well, let's look at the forces here. Is there gravity? Of course there is. There's gravity pouring down. Is there friction? Yes, there's friction. Which way is friction going? Well, if the ball is going on the loop, -loop this way, friction is going to be going that way. Is there tension? Is there a rope? No. Is there reaction force? Yes, reaction force is a force of a surface pushing down on it, or pushing on it. In this case, the surface is up here. It's going to push down on it. So I'm going to draw that there over here, F bar. And there is our uh, free body diagram. Kind of messy a little bit. So this can simplify a little bit. Because if we want to look at the minimum force need to make it around the loop to loop, the minimum force. Basically, that means that it just, it just left the loop to loop. Like it's not touching anymore. It just barely left it. If we get rid of that, that touching, 
then two of these forces go away. There's no longer a reaction force because it's already left. And there's no friction because there's no rubbing of the surfaces together. So it's just gravity. So if I already drew a net force equation uh, to figure out the minimum speed to get around the slip to loop, well, let's look at it. Our net force equation would be Fc equals mv squared over r equals gravity. That's it. Now, we can actually go a little more uh, detailed here. The equation for gravity is mg. So I can write that out, mg. And look at this. So the mass is the matter because they cancel out. Uh, basically, the radius of the loop, that's given. Uh, you, you just get the radius of the loop with the uh, half wave of a diameter. And g on Earth is gravity, 9.81. So really, this equation can simplify, like mass cancel out, v squared over r is equal to g. So if we can know what r and g are, <laughs> then we can figure out how fast does this object need to travel to make it around the loop. And that will change based off the radius of the circle and on gravity if we did this on a different planet. Speaking of different planets, let's talk about orbits. Let's talk about orbits of different things in space. So I'm going to do two different orbits. They're going to have exactly the same free body diagram, exactly the same net force equation. Let's talk about, here's a, uh, the Earth. Oh, there's my Earth. Probably John, you get that beat up. Um, and I take something and I launch it in space. So basically, I like to think about a satellite as a projectile. If I take a ball and I throw it, it does this. It goes up, it lands. If I take the ball and I throw it faster, it goes up higher and it lands farther away. If I take the ball and throw it even faster yet, it goes up higher and it lands farther away. You get the idea. So if I throw it fast enough, I can actually get the ball to go up so high that by the time it starts to fall back down, the Earth is round. And that's one reason we know the Earth is round, is because we have satellites that orbit Earth. And by the time it starts to fall back towards Earth, it actually just ends up back where it started. And now it's still falling, but it just keeps going around in a circle. It's falling in the same circular path that the Earth is round. In other words, it can't get to the Earth because as it's falling, the Earth is also curved, so it never gets there. So it's just a projectile. And if you look at the free body diagram for projectile, it's just gravity. The only force acting on um, a projectile is gravity. So what's the net force equation look like? Well, it's going on in a circle. So Fc equals mv squared over r equals gravity. There we go. We have that. We have that relationship. So in order to figure out how fast something needs to orbit the Earth, we just need to know the radius of the Earth and the acceleration of gravity on Earth. So really the only thing we need to know, because we know what not going to hit one is, is a race to the Earth. We've got GPS systems for that. We have time zones for that. We have planes that can travel distances in a certain amount of time to figure out the race to the Earth. Nice. Now let's talk about the sun. The sun and the Earth also follow the same idea. So the Earth is like a projectile that's orbiting the sun, but a much bigger radius. So once again, what's the free body diagram look like? Well, gravity is going towards the sun this time. And now we have Fc equals mv squared over r equals mg. But this time the g is the value of the sun's gravity, not 9.81. It's going to be a much bigger number because that's the orbit Earth. And the last one we'll do is about angled um, motion. Now let's say I take this ball and I start to orbit it in a circle like this. You notice how it kind of swings outwards? And the faster I orbit it, the more it swings outwards. That's because of the ball's momentum wants to keep it going in a straight line. It's this intuitive force that causes it to go in a circle. So I'm just going to go a nice small angle here. And I want to figure out all the forces acting on the ball. Boom, we'll pause it right there, like a freeze frame. What forces were acting on the ball during that motion? Well, we know the string is going this way. So there's our tension. We know gravity is going down because the Earth is down. There it is. Is there friction? Maybe a little bit of air resistance, but very small amount. Is there reaction force? No, the ball's not resting on anything. Which way is the ball orbiting? To the, well, in this case, it's going around the circle, the center of the circle right here. So centrifugal force should be going to the right. We don't necessarily need to label the centrifugal force, but we know 
that these two forces, if we put them together, make the centripetal force happen. If I combine these two forces, I get my centripetal force. Let's see if I can do that. Well, I have an angle and two slides here. Here's my FT, here's my FC, and here's my FG. I can make a triangle with it. So I can combine my forces that way. So in a nutshell, centripetal force, here's the takeaway message. Centripetal force is the force that's left over as a result of all these other forces. And we know it's a centripetal force rather than just F net, just a generic F net equals MA. We know it's a centripetal force because it's going in a circle. So it's the same thing as net force, but this, net, this time the net force is causing a circular motion rather than a linear motion moving in a straight path, slowing down, speeding up. This is going in the same speed in a circle. But it follows the same relationships. We still figure out our other forces, writing that force equation with it, but this time we're going to have forces FC, and bada bing, bada boom, we solve. We just plug it in and solve. Boom! 